So Johnny just came over and uh, told me to come and have a look at a couple of photos of Christmas Day 2001 and we've just gotten through the bushfire crisis this weekend and Christ knows how we dodged a bullet but he's got these photos and I'll give you a close up of them. That's actually our factory uh, 18 years ago when it burnt down the first time. So if you look at that there, that wall there is actually the wall you can see in the distance there and there's my dome, the tent, and my factory's up the back. So don't believe it doesn't happen, boys and girls. Uh, that's it, and unfortunately now, the shed behind us up, up the back there now is actually, there's two more streets now, whereas the bushland went right to our edge. But that was Ember Attack, and it came through from the, the north across here and burned out the likes of Hobie Cat Australia, um, you know, there's a lot of guys lost their businesses over that period, but yeah, that's our factory and I'll give you a zoom in of those uh, those photos and yeah, you can wonder why we're on edge, guys. We wonder why we're on edge. <sighs> January 3rd, guys, 38 degrees. Um, we've got a, like what they call a catastrophic fire situation all around us, pretty much a 250, 300 kilometre long fire front that... Uh, yeah, potentially could hit us tomorrow. So I'm up at the factory. The house is ready. I mean, there's nothing more I can do. I've got all my gutters filled, everything. You know, we we love this country, but Jesus, when it burns, it's a bastard. But uh, I've come up here and I've just pulled this tree down, uh, which was only about sort of two and a half meters high, but it was against my tent. It's been growing up inside there like a terrarium, you know, the thing was bloody growing in there. I was loving the humidity and the temperature in there. Don't know about the styrene, but you know, um, I've just had a massive clean up. I'm gonna go to the tip, hopefully I can get rid of it today, because tomorrow they've actually evacuated all, all of tourists on the south coast, south of Sydney. We're talking a thousand Ks of tourists, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them are stuck on the highways at the moment because they can't get through. Um, tomorrow, 44 to 49 degrees and howling northwesterly winds with a monster southerly change at around about 10 o'clock at night. So we're on alert, one ember on there and it's all over boys and girls, you know, and that's what we're fearful of. Um, all of our friends have evacuated, pretty much everyone I know has uh, taken their kids and, and done the run to Sydney, joined the masses. Uh, look, we're pretty clear of bushland around here. There's, I mean, there's bush just there and, uh, and on the other side over there and it has burnt out before. So 18 years ago, this whole factory complex was pretty much leveled. This is all reason we knew it's only 15, 16 years old. So, you know, that's the sort of shit we deal with here and without sort of it's sensationalised, but oh, I'm rooted. I've been going since about 7.30 this morning. Got all the rubbish out from under the deck mould. There's absolutely no rubbish around this site now. I've cleaned up all the way down the sides, chopped out a couple of trees that were sort of overhanging into the tent and, and on it. You know, any ember can set these bastards off. Um, and all our gutters are clean. Now, typically we'd like to fill these gutters with water, but you know, I'm not getting up there. <laughs> That's just eight metres high. I'm not getting up on that bugger again. But you know, this is what we deal with here in Oz, and you know, it's all part of uh, part of living here. And uh, and you know, you got to heed the warnings. And everyone's bolted. We've got our fire plan. We reviewed it again with our kids, with with Ellen. She's home. Sam lives in Sydney, but uh, you know, Janet's peaking. I'm peaking. Everyone's peaking. <laughs> There's not one person I know that isn't a little bit uh, concerned about tomorrow, because we know what we're dealing with. And you know, this is not a usual bushfire. These are firestorms, 200, 300 foot high flames that are going to come through. If it comes through at the moment, we are horseshoed by it, and that northwesterly is that direction there, so it's likely to come this way if the ember attack starts. Sitting here at the tip uh, with about, uh, I've had about a half hour wait. Everyone's panicking and getting rid of all their refuse, all their vegetation. I mean, it's uh, pretty crazy. There's a massive lineup of people here, and uh, I'm sitting here waiting to go across the Weybridge, so uh, should be able to get rid of my green waste and get on with it. So it's uh, nine in the morning and it's already 30 degrees. So Christ knows how we're gonna go through today. Um, I've just put a power boat up here that I rebuilt about uh, five years ago up here at the, uh, up at the factory. It's out in the open, you know, it's pretty much what else can you do? You just gotta get it away from any bushland. Um, I've got hoses already up here, should anyone get up here. It does appear that there's no power here, so it looks like uh, either they've cut the power for emergency services or uh, or something's burnt through, we don't really know. So I'm going to head down back home, which is about a kilometre away, 
and uh, start filling my roofs again and uh, you know hold on so yeah stay tuned guys stay tuned I reckon that's about the weirdest day I've ever put in we've been waiting here for the inevitable sort of howling nor'wester 48 degree heat and you know it just didn't eventuate thank Christ um, you know, it's six o'clock at night now. It's quarter to seven, actually. Uh, there's a massive southerly change about to hit us, so we're not really sure what that's going to do, but at least it's not hot. Um, I'm a bit worried Janet and Ellen have been evacuated into town. Into town, I've been holding out here until it was too dangerous to to uh, stay any longer. But, uh, yeah, nothing's happened, thank God, and I'm going to go in and have a beer. <laughs> Well, if there is a God, certainly he's friggin' shining on us today. I mean, two days after we had the most horrific sort of scare, we were all on tender hooks for about, about a month of this tension, and uh, you can hear thunder in the background, and for the first time that thunder has actually got rain in it. Um, normally, that thunder means for us dry lightning strikes, more fires. Um, I've got to say, I've never been so glad to hear rain. We've had a couple of spots over the last couple of days. We had a bit of dampness yesterday, day before yesterday, 46 degrees, friggin' furnace conditions, and you know, everywhere was burning. Um, today we've got rain, and uh, you know, I can hear it on the tent, and that's really cool. So we're pretty happy to hear that. Hopefully, it's sort of bringing some of the ash out of the sky so we can breathe because the smoke's been just fucking horrendous. And uh, you know, Thanks for all your thoughts, guys. Really appreciate it out there. We, uh, as a town, have dodged a bullet with the fires. I'm not convinced most businesses here are going to struggle. Uh, we've lost all our tourism for the next three or four months, I'd imagine. No one's going to be coming back here in any hurry. Um, basically, 20k south here, hundreds of houses lost, hundreds of homes, and all the bushland and the animal life. You just can't put into words what this country's going through at the moment. And, uh, you know, it's pretty emotional shit because we go through it so often and you know, it just doesn't seem to be an answer to it. And, uh, you know, I'm just glad to see my project still standing, my family safe, my factory still standing. And, uh, you know, it was never really in danger, but we did all the preparation we could have. And, you know, thanks for thinking about us, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, back to work today, back into it. I'm going to stop standing around worrying, I'm just going to get on with it and get the bastard built. Right, uh, so I just got back from my trip to Sydney and uh, yeah, what a great trip. I've been able to um, uh, finally uh, finalise some of my ideas with regard to my tankage. The reason why I haven't completed my Blackwater tanks is because I've been holding off until I came up with the right solution for all of my pickup straws, my senders, all of the uh, the things that I wanted to incorporate into my tanks, plus manageability, maintenance and serviceability. And I've come up with a really good solution. I'm very, very fortunate to have uh, come up with the idea with Scott from RW Bashams, who was my plumbing guy that I had in a previous episode. Um, we were able to sort of think out the best way that I could put um, a pre-manufactured lid or something into my tanks so that I can then ultimately service the inside of the tanks, replace fittings should I need to ever, and, uh, and all those sorts of things that go through your mind when you're putting stuff under a floor that you're not going to have great access to. So what we've come up with is, you know, Scotty's been holding a few of these for me. I've got four of them. Uh, the other one's on its way. The beauty of these is that these were old tanks that have, uh, you know, either been removed from boats and replaced with different styles and the like, or they've had uh, small issues with um, with flaws in them or whatever. So, and and you never ever throw this sort of stuff out if you're uh, if you sort of get hold of stuff because there's always another use for it. And I want to try and repurpose stuff if it's useful. Um, I obviously don't want to be putting old and faulty stuff in my boat, but this is not where I'm going here. What I, what we came up with was. Um, I saw these, and these are actually a pre-manufactured lid, and they're from Diablo Tanks, and they're available in kit form, like so. Now, my original thought was that I would cut the hole, I'd cut the hole in my tank lid, my foam core lid, to the width of this and epoxy this in place and then I've got all of my parts available to me. Now that was a great idea. The only issue with that is it can't be unscrewed. Because it's got a thread in it and a seal, it can't be undone. So therefore you're only gonna have access through these holes uh, into the, the tank unless I put a subsequent hatch beside it that has a thread on it. So when we were discussing this at the boat show, I looked down and saw 
these brand new tanks, not these ones, but the actual brand new tanks. And I thought, oh, it'd be great if I could use that thread um, that's incorporated into the tank lid. And Scott said, I've got an idea. I've actually got some tanks that we're holding on to that uh, you know you can you can basically have and i went oh cool so what i can now do is i intend to cut these rims out here drill a hole in my lid in my foam core lids over here on these tanks and in my water tanks and then i'll be able to screw thread these in so imagine being able to simply screw a lid on like that i buy the lid in a kit with all its fittings, its pickup straws. I mean, I'm gonna have to extend a couple of these straws, but I buy everything in one kit with all its fittings. You know, this is black water, obviously, because it's brown, and uh, and it's also available in fresh water, blue, and it's also available in fuel. Now, the fuel tanks are no, no good for me because I've already had tanks pre-made, but all the fittings are here, and I can buy all these parts separately. It's even got a locking pin device here that I can lock the lid in place once it's sealed down. I mean, it just does not get any better than that. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna cut these out. I'm gonna get them on the bandsaw and make a perfect circle on these rims. And then I'll be able to sicker flex them down to my completed lids and then uh, basically put stainless screws, six or eight of them around there to lock them down. And then I'll be able to just thread my lids on. I'll drill a hole here. I'm not going to tell you to suck eggs because we've all used jigsaws before, but we're going to drill a hole here and uh, start my jigsaw, cut around the top of this rim, and then I'll clean up with the more sort of accurate bandsaw um, to, uh, to get this perfect edge here. Yeah. Okay, so I've got the hatch rims uh, all cut out, and what I need to do though, is I need to make sure that I'm going to be able to fit the lid uh, where my baffles are. So what I've done is I've actually found out, I've made a line here where the baffles are actually sitting. Which is right here. And because the rim is going to have a number of stainless bolts holding them in place. I need to make sure that that's actually going to clear where the baffle is. So it's going to have to sit around the midsections here, which is, has to basically be where it needs to be because the pickup straw needs to be right down here, essentially, to the bottom of the tank. Now that's actually going to also determine the position of these locating pins because what I want to do is make sure I get my pickup straw exactly in the center so there'll be a bit of fiddling around to make sure that it all fits perfectly but for now that's going to give me my pinpoint my point for uh for actually starting to cut out this hatch and i'm going to put it dead smack in the center and essentially uh i've then got to derive the actual template of the cutout which is here and just cut it out with a the jigsaw then i'm going to have to core the foam seal it with epoxy paint the lid and then fit this afterwards. But 
for now, I can do quite a bit of work, preparatory work for that uh, until I get the, the uh, tank guard to finish the tanks inside. Right, so I've worked out the center point of this uh, of this hatch is right here. Um, but a fool would cut that hole. But that's not the hole I need. I need this outer hole. So I'm going to have to go home and get my school stuff out, my old uh, tech drawing compass, to work out this cut out here, which is actually at exactly 260 mils. So these marks I've made here. Uh, the actual cutout size so what i'll do is i'll from the center point i'll just go there do my circle cut that hole out core out the foam fill that with epoxy and then i'm going to be able to seat this hatch rim in here like so and then i'll be able to turn it to work out exactly where the pickup straw for the black water which is going to be around here somewhere is sitting in this place when it's completely tightened. So these are a lot of things that have to happen here to make sure that I'm gonna get that straw right dead in the center of this tank. But uh, yeah, all good. That's how I'm gonna go about it. Isn't it wonderful when you go through your late dad's tools and all these bits and pieces? My dad was a tool maker and a weapon manufacturer for uh, uh, the Australian Defense uh, Force and they used to make style rifles and you know some pretty serious weapons but uh, as a draftsman in his earlier earlier age um he used to use these things and i'm sure everybody that's watching this channel because you're all of my vintage are uh, very familiar with a set of these i don't think anyone under 40 would understand what the hell these things are for but you don't realize how valuable beautiful tools like these i mean this thing is worth god knows probably two dollars nowadays one of the most incredible sets of tools you can ever use. But, uh, you know, I've got to use for the old compass and uh, I need it on these hatches. So thank God you keep good stuff like that. I mean, look at it. I love my dad. You know, he used to label everything with his name on there. Merv Boardman. Funny guy. He used to keep a, a list of anything I borrowed and within three or four months he'd be on to me. It was like a library. If you borrowed a tool from him, it had to be returned. I think we all should have that rule, don't you reckon? So I'm trying to work out how to do this circle and I thought, Jesus, I need a compass. I used to love technical drawing, almost became a road design draftsman when I was younger. I think I missed out on that job by about one person. Uh, so I'm pretty happy I didn't get it because I'd be fairly redundant by this stage. All right, so because it's fiberglass, it's very slippery, my compass needle is not going to stick in this. So I'm gonna Okay, so I'm going to use a jigsaw to cut this out. It's um, very importantly that you always drill your hole on the inside of the hole, not on the outside, and then work your way out. So. Fortunately, these kits come with pretty much everything I need. Now, the issue I'm going to have is that this tube's only 380 mil long. It needs to probably be another uh, 15 centimetres, 150 mil longer than this here. So I'm going to have to get an extension and probably put a sleeve over it and, and glue it together to make sure that I get my pickup tube right down into the base of my tank. You also notice it's cut on an angle, and that's obviously clearly so that uh, 
it's not going to get suction on the bottom of the tank or close to the bottom of the tank where I want it to be drawing from. But if you look at it, it actually has an O-ring or a double O-ring groove here. Uh, we've got our uh, 38 mil tube piping here, which will suit a 40 mil pipe or tube and some 25 mil fittings and some 18 mil fittings. So there's plenty here in this pack and essentially uh, assembling this is going to be pretty simple. And you know, it's just taken a lot of the guesswork out of it for me. So I've just come up and done a test fit of the Blackwater tank under this companionway, and you can see it down here, I'll show you a close up here in a moment. Um, all's well, it ends well. There's around about that much room under the floor hatch panel that fits right in here uh, to allow for my hoses to fit on the mounts. Now that uh, was sort of intentional, I went for maximum capacity, and uh, the, I guess the issue was that that lip that I've now uh, going to glue on the top of, or the rim that I'm actually gluing on the top of the tanks is in fact around about five or six mils high. So just squeezed it in. Uh, more good luck than more good management. Oh, I've come up with a bit of a dilemma. Um, I'm only gonna have around 10 millimeters of clearance between the top of these fittings on my tanks and my floor. Now, that's probably enough to get the hose on and the clamps and everything, but I'm thinking long term, access to these has to be clear and pretty, pretty uh, concise. So what I intend to do, and I've had a real think about it, it's going to create a bit of work for me, probably a day's work, but it will give me a lot of freedom for movement later on, is I'm going to actually, although I've cut this hole and inset these in or glued them on top, what I really want to do is get this surface down around about another 10 or 15 millimetres so that I've really got good clearance that I don't have to manufacture or change hatch shapes or anything to uh, on the underside of these hatches. I want to basically just make a hatch, stick it in place and not have to retrofit anything. So the issue I'm going to have here is that I think it's going to be these hoses are going to potentially rub on the hatches, on the underside of the hatches, and I don't want that to happen. I want clearance. I want to be able to basically lift the hatch off and have no wear and tear and uh, plenty of room for movements. So what I've decided to do is this is the cutout, um, which is virtually useless, but I'm going to use that somewhere else. But I'm going to actually cut out a larger rim and get this guy to sit right down that plastic rim there flush with the underside of this lid. And why I wanna do that, that'll drop it. But what I then have to do is I'm gonna to have to glue an internal flange under here, underneath here, so that the lid is actually sitting down flush with the top of this. Now, I'm gonna lose a little bit of capacity. I'm probably talking about 500 mils in the tank, but what I'll gain is really good access across the top of the tank and all of my fittings on the top. So yeah, it's okay them sitting on here flush and I could route this out, I could do everything, but I think if I just jigsaw it out and so that I'm still able to put the rim um, flat down and level with the underside of the tank, I'm gonna have much, much better clearance and uh, and I'll be a lot happier guy. I uh, wish I'd thought of it first, but it wasn't until I went up and test fitted it and I really couldn't do it until I test fitted it anyway because I just think it's a little bit too close. Look. Right, so now I've got my uh, hatch cut out. I can now just take that onto my water tanks and use that. What I now need to do is create one, a template for one that actually fits underneath it. So I need around about two centimetres. So I'm gonna go back to the original shape of this hatch. That'll be my inner lip. And then I need to allow around about two centimetres on the outside of that to fit up underneath that lid so that this can then be inset into the lid. So a bit of work, but it's just the way to make hatches, you know, and, and I've got plenty of this uh, 10 millimeter glass laminate foam that I've made over the, over the time to, uh, to complete this job.
one and a half. I'm, I'm going to make it four centimetres from the outside of this rim. Funnily enough, that took a bit of working out. Um, <laughs> always does. But uh, yeah, essentially, so the lid, that's the original cutout. This is the size of the complete lid. So including the tabs on the side so I can still spin them. And then I've got the actual under rim and this is the cutout. So how this is going to work is that under here, I'm gonna glue or epoxy a rim under here. I'm going to cut out this excess hole and I'll have this rim epoxied under here and therefore this will then be inset into the mould and all I've lost is about 10 mil of uh, 10 millimetres of hatch lid space which is going to not going to affect the capacity pretty much at all but it will give me an extra 15 mil of clearance for my hoses, my uh, uh, hose clamps, and all of the access that I need to that tank cannot be good enough, you know, and every boat I've been on, access is critical, and if it's not good, it's a bastard of a job. I'll probably never have to do this again, but I'm gonna make a, a uh, MDF template of it, um, just because I've gotta do four of them, and you know how cardboard sort of great, but it's not that great, so. If I make this out of MVF, which will take me about an extra five minutes, um, at least I have something a little bit more substantial for the four that I've got to make. So that is my under ring. So now I've got this um, under lid ring that I need to make. I got thinking that, uh, you know, if I cut out four of those for the four hatches I need to make, or for the four lids for the tanks that I need to make, I'm gonna waste a hell of a lot of laminate that I've already blasted up. Um, so if I cut out that, you know, that's essentially the rest of it's a write off other than the fact that I've got a circle to deal with. So what I've decided I'm gonna do, I'm gonna actually cut it in half, turn it into two smaller rings, and then I'll be able to just overlay the smaller parts over and probably end up using around about one and a half times the amount of laminate, of foam core laminate that I've already made instead of four giant chunks, which is going to be about four or five feet long with wasted discs in between. Sometimes you just got to be clever like that and you can see uh, a lot of um, pattern makers and things like that, they'll use a program to make sure they overlay their templates to get the maximum use of this stuff because I don't want really to throw any of this out, bad for the environment, bad for me. It was going to take a bit of time, didn't realise it was going to take that long, but you know, this is a great solution. Actually, I reckon I saved probably about half of the amount of laminate. It wasn't quite uh, a third, but you know, half quite possibly by cutting these individually, but at least they're done now. So I can now install them on the bottom of all the lids and create that rim that I was after. I want to do some nice tidying up around it and route maybe perhaps to get a rounded finish down into the uh, into the actual um, uh, the lid of the of the black water and the freshwater tanks, but there's going to be a little bit of work to do. So I'm going to peel, rip the peel ply off and I'm just going to simply epoxy it in place. And then I'll, uh, I'll start a tidy up process tomorrow once I get them in place and then I'll be able to go forward obviously with uh, with my paint that I'm going to put on it, that Tank Guard 412, highly chemical resistant. Um, I'm also going to put a layer of flow coat on the outside of my tanks because they look pretty ugly and there's, there's a lot of stuff to do here before I can seal those tanks down and what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the lint, that hatch rim on last so that I can make sure that I have a really good seal up underneath with a fillet perhaps uh, when I go to paint out my tanks. So last job is to weigh it down. Now that I'm pretty happy with the placement, always put a bit of plastic over the top. There's nothing worse than sitting a bucket on there coming in tomorrow and it's actually joined to your product. So a little bit of black plastic 
And uh, then we want to spread that load pretty evenly. So a piece of MDF or a piece of wood or something over the top of that with some weight will uh, do the trick. So I've come in this morning and I've removed the uh, the weights that I had on here. And, and yeah, I've come in and it's absolutely perfect. Those rims are now totally solid. Um, you can see here that they're not exactly uh, nice and smooth. So I'm going to get my Dremel and my roller sander. And I'm going to tidy these up to fit these rims. Now these rims do fit. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of little rough edges. So I'm going to tidy them up. So that I can get a perfect fit in there, but yeah, that's going to be a great solution, and uh, and yeah, really time to start finishing these so that I can get some paint on them and uh, and get them sealed up. So and I now have a really good fit here. Um, I guess the one thing I have to be concerned about is these tabs on the ends here. So these parts here, they still need to be able to spin freely within the entire rim here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm actually going to bevel the outside at 45 degrees in so that it's a, it's a nice rounded ramp onto that flange down there and then it won't be an issue. Um, look, I, I want it to look as good as it is, but I also want it to function well, but looking good, is my second big concern, but by beveling this entire edge here, firstly I can get a really good um, seal into the foam, and secondly I can get some glass down onto there again and and complete the job properly. You know that's that's ninety percent of it is doing it properly. last minute job at the end of the day. I've got a glass, uh, some light rovings into these rims. So the problem I've got is I've got foam here, glass here. Very important that I don't just leave that exposed because any water that might settle in the lid of this tank may well work into the foam, delaminate the lid. We don't want that, we want it finished properly. So what I've come up with is um, a couple of patches of this uh, 100 gram, now this would be commonly known as surfboard cloth. We would uh, lay this up on a, on a surfboard, two layers of that on a glass foam board and that's it, yeah, that's your surfboard. I'm gonna put two layers on here, on this uh, rim edge here. And basically just laminate that to the lid and then I'll be able to simply epoxy straight over it with the paint. So that'll get it uh, nice and uh, sealed and it's a pretty quick end of day job. I just want to get it done and get out of here so that I can uh, uh, get home, have a, uh, I possibly have a beer today because it's about 35 degrees today and uh, yeah, I've really felt the heat. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm just gonna smash it out just before I go home, reckon about 10 minutes and it'll all be done. Thanks for joining me this week, guys. It's been a bit of a rugged week with the uh, the bushfire crisis, etc. But you know, hopefully that's all behind us now, and we can um, we can move on. The fires are still raging, but uh, it's going to be a little bit of a while before we get enough rain to really put these fires out. Um, we're all breathing a bit of a sigh of relief, and the temperatures are definitely cooled down. But you know, for now, 
Um, I'm still moving forward and what I've found with this project is some of the intricacies such as doing dealing with these lids has taken up quite a deal of time but you know ultimately the result is going to be a lot better for me in the long run. I could easily have bought tanks that uh, didn't quite fit but you know I'm pretty happy with the fact that I've been able to make these tanks and certainly make videos about it hopefully uh, not too much detail and it hasn't been too long and drawn out this one but uh, you know I felt it important to cover that fire section at the beginning of this video because it, it did have a massive impact on us uh, everyone that we know has had a major impact on the anxiety levels that you know, have been pretty hard to deal with with uh, the local community here they're still ongoing and will continue to do so for a long time so don't forget to uh, like it if you liked the video, if you didn't like it, let me know why and certainly make a comment. And I uh, appreciate all your comments and all your thoughts, guys. And, uh, and I'll see you next time on Life on the Holes. Thanks, guys. Bye.